Well, I think we will um, officially start this panel discussion. My watch is showing it's uh, two o'clock here in uh, Norway, which is the time that we plan to start. And I want to welcome, first of all, our panel, but also our audience, which is joining us online. We will give you a little bit more time to join in. And I just want to give you some general background information. This is a discussion organized by INSA, which is the International Red Network for Science Government Advice, which is more than, I think, 5,000 members all over the world. And it's part of a global week of dialogue. Um, and uh, hopefully some of you have been able to already watch um, the, the high panel, um, high level discussion that was earlier today. Um, and um, that is also uh, shown tomorrow and was yesterday. It is actually a global dialogue that started out with Asia yesterday and will be continuing with Africa and, um, and America uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And um, I um, just want to remind you that the theme of our panel discussion is basically science advice for policy or for governments and COVID-19. You know, and even though we are in the middle of the pandemic still, as many of us painfully experience, um, we have already some time behind us and we thought it would be a good time just to reflect a little bit on how it has gone so far, what we might have learned, what did not work, what did work, and how can we be more um, doing a better job maybe in, in, in managing these crises with the help of science uh, in, in it. I will also just remind everybody that this session will be recorded so it will be downloadable after some time, I guess. And uh, I will also remind the audience that um, not you can put in some questions here in the chat function, and we will try to attend to that as good as we can. On the other hand, we don't we won't interrupt a, an ongoing discussion too much. So maybe not all of your questions will be will have a chance to be taken up. But we'll hope to take up some of them. Um, I will also mention that uh, tomorrow uh, in the afternoon there will be a European satellite event about the thesis, about the topic, science advice, what works in a crisis. That uh, the reference there, and you can also find on the on the INSA on the INSA net uh, website. So, what do we want to do with the panel here now? We want we have a diverse panel, all of them placed in Europe, and uh, the, our panelists have different roles and different backgrounds and have different experiences with, you know, how science came into this crisis and how science advice was working in designing policies that could help us through this pandemic and this crisis. And um, we, I must unfortunately admit that we are still lacking a connection to our first panelist. Uh, he might hopefully come in a little bit later, but we are not quite sure what the difficulties are right now. But so far, we are very lucky to have three of our panels, panelists already with us. And the first one is uh, Anne Great Kaiser. Um, and uh, from the Netherlands, and she's a senior research fellow at the N Netherlands Scientific Council for Government Policy, and also former executive secretary of ESAF, which is a network also for scientific advice or forum for scientific advice in Europe. And uh, then we'll have, and I welcome also Alessandra Sampieri, who sits in Italy in a beautiful place called ISPRA, where uh, the European Union has a unit called, um, um, what's it called, Joint Research Center, 
And uh, Alessandra is uh, the head of the unit for um, the disaster risk management and has also been highly, very much involved now in this pandemic crisis and the, and the information to Brussels. She will tell us more about that. And then who is also present already, that is Professor Debbie Sridhar. And she is placed in Scotland, I think we should say, in Edinburgh. And she's professor and chair of global public health at this university. So very welcome to all of you. And um, I'm really looking forward to, look at, to hearing your uh, opinions and your input in this global dialogue. As I said, we want, to, we want to take a look at what have you learned so far, what were your personal experiences in it, and what are your views on how we could do better. So, but first of all, give us a short presentation of your role so far and your experiences. Can we start with Anna Great? Maybe you do that and give us a, a short impression of that. Thank you, Matthias, and uh, thanks Insa, Insa for this invitation and for putting this interesting panel together. Um, my input today will be mainly based on a virtual ESAF meeting we had, uh, we organized last June, and this meeting was devoted to science advice in the COVID-19 crisis. And ESAF stands for the European Science Advisors Forum, and it's an independent platform of European science-based advisors that promotes and facilitates the use of evidence-based policy. Um, and in preparation for our meeting, we asked all the members to describe the strategy that was followed in their country. And this was of course not an extensive evaluation and it was also at a time when a lot of the countries were still in the middle of, 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 the, of the first wave. However, there was one surprising outcome uh, of our meeting, and that was that countries with an established science advice structure for this type of pandemic, um, um, that countries without such a structure were able to set up an effective ad hoc advice structure and sometimes were more successful than countries with pre-existing mechanisms. So during the meeting, we discussed uh, possible explanations for this. Um, and one idea was that established structures were designed uh, based on previous outbreaks, previous crises. And this was a new virus, at least for Europe, it was very new. Uh, and some of the existing preparations have proven to be uh, inaccurate for this vir uh, virus. And so this raises the question whether established structures make us less flexible to determine what is needed for uh, a particular crisis uh, at hand. However, we also discussed that ad hoc, ad hoc structures uh, face challenges, especially regarding data gathering and data sharing. What we also saw is that in some countries, the existing structures were dominated by public health specialists, virologists, epidemiologists. And there was, in some countries, a resistance to bringing in experts from other disciplines. For instance, uh, in the Netherlands, the government seemed to be reluctant to open up the structure that was in place, and probably because they had a good working relation and uh, a relation of trust with the advisors that were part of this structure. And I think that illustrates that to organize multi or interdisciplinary uh, mechanisms, uh, you need uh, good organization and coordination. So that might be something we can uh, uh, get back to. Um, yes. One of the things that was also mentioned is that this pandemic has shown that um, uh, often science policy interfaces are built in uh, peacetime but our system should also be equipped to work in uh, wartime as well. And it's interesting to discuss whether this uh, um, uh, requires different models and adaptability. But the point that was also made is that it's also important to understand that the effectiveness of advice not just depends on formal structures, but also on the communicative and listening skills of both the experts and the politicians. So these are just some first ideas that came from uh, our meeting in uh, June. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna Great. And uh, by the way, by now I see that uh, Professor Christian Rosten has joined us from Berlin, from the Charité. Welcome, uh, we have already started, Christian, 
We will come back to you in a minute. We'll just have an introductory round with two minutes or so reflection from each of them. And, uh, but I want to turn to uh, Alessandra now. And Alessandra, you heard something that was already quite interesting on the variety in the European, in the European realities in meeting this pandemic. And uh, I mean, this is one of the big problems you have probably dealt with uh, from, the, uh, from your standpoint, right? Tell us a little bit about it. Sure, Matthias. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to all, to, to the other speakers, uh, to Inksa. Thanks for the invitation to, to address this audience and also to all those who are connected online. Uh, as you correctly said, I work at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And allow me to explain who we are and what we do, because maybe not everybody knows us. We are 3,000 scientists placed in five different member states in Europe but uh, working with the same mission, which is the mission to provide scientific support to our colleagues in Brussels, first of all, to policymakers inside the Commission, but we also work with the Member States. So since in our own mission, in our DNA, the, the question mark that you, we put ourselves is how can we ensure that science and policy dialogue works? Which are the tools that we can use to influence and to make this dialogue works better. And this is why when the pandemic started, when this crisis started, we have been asked to, to, to play our role and to provide our help, first of all, to the European Commission. I am uh, responsible inside this uh, science and knowledge service of the Commission for disaster risk management. And this was a big crisis. It was a, the, the, the crisis of, of this century and probably also of the previous century. And really all possible tools and all possible help inside the commission was needed to tackle that. Everybody was taken by surprise and we the scientists was projected on the scene in the first row everywhere in the member states. And as you said, there were differences, differences in culture in the member states, differences in the way this was communicated difference in, in how it was approached and and the, and our president of the commission who is a scientist herself she is she has a background scientific background immediately created this uh, scientific advisory board and she did ask us to help there directly to her directly the heart of the institutions to put science immediately at the heart of all policy decisions taken in europe and this worked very well because this gave the first sign that science was important immediately in dealing with the crisis. Then many things happened, and I think we will have the time to talk about this. But already now, let me tell you that I had the opportunity to lead this task force. And this is very important in my experience in being successful in, in providing scientific advice. The fact that we immediately put together a cross, a cross team, a multidisciplinary team of 80 scientists providing advice on many aspects of the crisis. Since the beginning, immediately we look at the academics, we look at the health related issues, but immediately we had the economists with us, we had the social scientists with us, and our advice was immediately multidisciplinary. And for us, this has been one of the main uh, success stories, the breaking the silos. What happened and what we did, I think we had opportunities to discuss uh, to discuss later, but uh, the most important message for me now is to say that since the beginning in the institutions, in the European institutions, science was at the heart of all discussions. That is good to hear, uh, Alessandra, very good. I also have some more questions in store about the European level, but we will come back to that. For now, I'll welcome uh, Christian here who has joined us. And uh, Christian, can you give us some immediate uh, sort of reflections on your role? What was your role? and uh, and uh, you obviously are working more on the on the state level, on a national basis in Germany, one of the central countries. So, what is your what are your immediate reflections and input to this panel discussion? Um, yeah, so so I'm not from an administrative uh, part. That's not my background. I'm a scientist. Um, um, I'm a scientist who happens to have worked on the subject of coronaviruses and particular, um, including SARS coronavirus, for a long time, for more than 17 years. That's what brought me into the discussion, nothing else. Um, 
And in Germany, um, like in many other countries, there, there was in the beginning of the whole process um, a reluctance, uh, of course, to accept that the, the pandemic will become a pandemic. Um, so like in many other countries, we had a, a public discourse over the probability and, and this discourse may be was um, somehow overruled by reality um, and was then up to governments to decide on measures. Uh, and the impression at that time was um, the, the, the events in Italy, in Northern Italy, um, and of course the impression of, of the lockdown that had been imposed middle of January in, in Wuhan and, and then um, growing. Um, and under this impression, Germany um, was in a situation to discover cases based on diagnostics rather than based on uh, hospital admissions or fatalities. Um, the reason for this was um, that uh, my group and, and others worked on the establishment of diagnostics early on, from January on. So Germany was in a position to actually diagnose cases along with standard influenza screening. Um, and this somehow gave a criterion for polis, politics in Germany um, to decide for um, contact reducing measures, non-pharmaceutical interventions um, earlier than other countries, not in terms of the calendar date, but in terms of the height of uh, the epidemic uh, wave, the, the development of, of actual cases. Um, and well, it, it seems that Germany is, is benefiting from this situation up to this day. So uh, we had low incidence after we lifted this rather mild lockdown. So everybody in Germany could go shopping during the lockdown and there was a lot of freedom to move. Um, and um, by now, it seems that incidence still is low over the whole summer season, it was low. Uh, we had intense testing for returning travelers. And it turns out that um, the cases that were brought into the country by returning travelers um, were discovered and didn't trigger the beginning of a second wave. So this really tells something about the low incidence in, in the actual uh, population. Um, but at the same time, we are seeing um, developments of, uh, that you could summarize as the prevention paradox. So you don't see what you've prevented. Um, so there are more and more voices in the public discussion now coming up. And these are not any more, any longer um, from, let's say, the margin of society, but they are coming from the middle of society. We, we are now seeing statements from professional medical organizations uh, in, in complete disbelief of the whole pandemic. And um, they question on, on, on hindsight, in retrospect, the validity and the usefulness of all non-pharmaceutical interventions imposed in spring. Um, and this is becoming a more and more difficult situation. It's, uh, we, are, we are now entering a phase where we have to be worried about losing public trust in, uh, in interventions and where we could see a rebound of cases if, if this continues, um, because the collaboration of the population, the, the inform, to, to inform the, um, the population, seems to, to be one of the most important non-pharmaceutical interventions. These things can't work without the collaboration of the population. And, and one thing that surprises me, and this is the last thing I'm, I'm going to say in this round, is how much we are living in a news and language bubble in Germany. So it seems that even members of professional medical organizations do not watch the events, uh, even in, in our closest neighbors in Europe, um, because they don't seem to really watch the news and communicate with their peers of their own discipline um, across the border to France, to the UK, to Spain. They are just not aware. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, I mean, Christian, you mentioned a whole number of issues that I think we, we probably will and or should come back to. This is quite interesting. Also this about the language bubbles here. But before that, I would like to turn to Debbie in Edinburgh and please give us a short statement about your experiences and your views so far. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. 
So I'm based at the University of Edinburgh and I'm a professor here in global health. Um, I've run a research team um, for about 10 years now, which has looked at the area of global health security, largely in low and middle income countries. Um, so countries like we've I've had a researcher out in Haiti, looking at cholera, um, Senegal, India, um, Tanzania. So trying to understand um, infectious disease control in very low resource settings. I've been working with the WHO, with UNICEF, um, UNESCO, but also largely um, international development agencies on these issues. Um, Germany, UK, um, and I only became really involved in domestic policy in late March after the UK went into lockdown. We went into lockdown quite late and about a week later, the Scottish government set up its own advisory group to complement SAGE, which is the group that advises the UK government to tailor that advice for the Scottish context and for the Scottish population. So I started getting involved there in that advisory role and had, have had other roles with Scottish government in terms of getting kids back to school. So a group on children and education. Um, and the Royal Society also set up a group um, in late March trying to learn from international experience saying, we don't really have RCTs for face coverings, but we can look abroad at the world and have observational studies of what's happening in East Asia or um, the Pacific and from that learn. And I chaired their working group, which tried to review that international evidence and feed it into SAGE. Um, I would say that in the UK, we had a different kind of debate. It started with the idea of herd immunity, which was what the government presented as its initial strategy, which is that you let the virus go and build up some kind of natural immunity when 60 to 80% of people or 50%, whatever the threshold is. Um, I think that was quickly reversed and we went into lockdown. Um, we then had a month or two discussing, does testing matter? Do you need to test COVID patients? Or um, what is your ultimate strategy? What are you trying to do? Um, there was a big focus at that point on getting a vaccine and investment in several promising vaccines and making sure you acquire them. And I think now, um, you know, the government's turned towards suppression and maximum suppression. Um, although, as, as Christian said, I think the big debate has constantly been between you know, just lift all restrictions, let's let life go back to normal and there's an acceptable loss versus um, we need to suppress the virus. I'd say the three things that we've learned, I think over the past few months that have at least changed my thinking is first at the start, the reason I think the government went for this kind of herd immunity approach was to save the economy. The idea was the economy is here and health is here and that you have to make a choice. And in the end, the economy affects millions, tens of millions, and COVID, the deaths will affect thousands or tens of thousands. So do you choose the millions or do you choose the thousands? And governments realizing their legacy will be the economic legacy, not the COVID legacy, because that's the millions of people and their populations. Um, I think that debate's happening in every country of the world, whether it's New Zealand, I guess, as well, with the restrictions that have been put in place there, to Germany, to the United States. But actually what we've seen is the countries that have controlled the virus and suppressed it have done better with their economic recovery. So the trying to pit them against each other is actually false. If we look at it the past six months, the countries that actually actively suppressed the virus have managed to get economic growth going. And the countries that haven't, unfortunately, Britain, the United States have suffered both huge economic losses, unemployment, as well as a very high number of deaths per capita. The second would be a phenomenon when we first heard about this virus in January and we're following quite closely what was happening in China and South Korea and the Diamond Princess cruise ship was there wasn't this phenomenon of long COVID or long haulers or people who seem to be suffering for months from having the virus. The idea was you die from it or you live from it and this obsession of what was the CFR is it 1%, 3%. And I think what's changed my mind is looking at the vast number of people, at least in the UK, in the thousands, um, age 30 to 59, so young, healthy people, often quite active, who are debilitated by this virus. Um, and so it's not only now about the death, it's about what do you do if you have a large group of people who need, and the NHS is now setting up physio sessions, scans, support centers. This is a huge economic and health um, um, burden, as, aside from the kind of morbidity implications for people's quality of life. And I, I've heard it described as possibly an autoimmune kind of disease or no one fully understands it, but that's a reason to be cautious. And the third is about how long immunity lasts and you know, this idea of, is there dark immunological matter? Are there T cells, are antibody, you know, seroprevalence studies um, accurate? So in Scotland, it's about 4% in seroprevalence studies. It seems quite low if we say we need to reach 50, 60%. 
there's been this view, oh, there's cross immunity from other coronaviruses. Um, I'm not a virologist, but that's what I'm hearing. And, and I just think it's a big unknown right now. Um, do we have large groups? Of, you know, is the bulk of the population still susceptible? These are things that are still being debated, at least in, in Britain, um, with the idea everyone points to Sweden and says they've reached herd immunity. And so we should just do what, what they do. And, and a part of me says, well, they have, but look at also Brazil and the United States. I mean, they're all kind of different ways of releasing restrictions and you see completely different kind of outcomes from that. Um, so I'll stop there and happy to be on the panel and to learn from all of you. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, let me just put, take up some of these points now to, to you individually. And I'll, I'll start with Anna Greg because one of the things that, that you mentioned from this uh, June meeting in the ASF, and this sounds very surprising. You said that there was a difference between those countries that had established mechanisms for you know, dealing with crises like that, the science advice system, and those that didn't have and were but more or less acting on a health basis. And I would say surprisingly, that having such a mechanism was no guarantee that you were doing better, rather maybe the opposite. Some of those ad hoc countries were doing better. I think in, in Germany, it's maybe it has been a little bit more ad hoc. I don't know. But uh, so what are your reflections on that? I mean, uh, what, would, what would that imply for, for us? Um, is it useful still to have an established mechanism for science advice? Yeah, well, I think we, we d debated that during our meeting and it's not that we have um, a clear answer already, but um, it was indeed interesting to see that the ad hoc structures were able to do, uh, to do quite well. And it's interesting what can established stru structures learn from this in the sense that it appears that it's good to be uh, flexible and adaptable uh, um, if there's a new crisis coming. I think it's also learning us things about how science works and how scientists work in the sense that um, scientists know that we that it's, it's a process of constant um, uh, gaining more knowledge, testing your ideas and being able also to uh, um, um, to change your, the ideas you had or the assumptions you had, you have to change them uh, if there's new evidence or, or, new, uh, um, uh, or reasons to, uh, to do that. I think that's one of the things, if I reflect on, on my own country, the Netherlands, that we see that there's also a difficulty with the experts to really acknowledge that over time, the advice, if you look back at the advice they gave in the start of the pandemic, that they have to adjust their ideas and their conclusions. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have these discussions about the use of wearing masks, and uh, our experts really stick to the idea, no, masks are not helpful because several reasons. And now more and more countries say, yeah, what well, they can be helpful. They're not the only solution, but they can be a helpful measure. And you see, there's some by, sometimes a difficulty uh, for experts to uh, change their minds on things. And that also has to do with, I think, a very important thing in this uh, pandemic is, and that's, uh, Christian also referred to it, is the communication of the measures uh, to politicians, but also to the general public. And I think in the first phase of the pandemic, we needed experts to, be, to give quite clear instructions on how people should behave. And people were, in most countries, quite willing to do so. But now, over time, we see that people um, uh, don't always see the use of these measures anymore. And, uh, and they just find it really hard to, uh, to stick to, the, to these measures. So I think in this phase, you also need advice from other disciplines to, uh, to, to learn uh, um, so that we can learn uh, uh, how to give, uh, how to present measures in a way that people uh, agree to stick to them also in the long term. Yes. Thank you very much. I think there is a number of things that I would like to come back to and actually ask Christian about this communication. But before that, Christian, I would turn to Alessandra. And following up a little bit, and also following up the, um, the high-level panel discussion, one of the topics there was the problem of the many voices. That is that it easily can 
appear as if there is a competition between many voices and many, many are appearing in the public, many experts with different opinions. Now, in Brussels, I, I feel on the European level, I mean, certainly you have to deal with all the, 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 the state experts at the state levels. That is one of the things. But even Brussels, I mean, you mentioned the JRC, the Joint Research Center, but also then there is the, what's it called, the European Center for Disease Pre Prevention in Stockholm, right, which probably is, should be right in, in, in the middle of that. And they have established what they call the SAM, the Science Advice Mechanism, with, uh, you know, the academies, all of that coming in. Has there been a confusion of, you know, how to use, how to use these different voices or, or was there more harmony in, in all of that? How did you see your, your role in this uh, cacophony, maybe, of, of different voices? <laughs> yes, cacophony, but um, we have always been uh, uh, careful to ensure that uh, at least the European Commission went out with uh, one single voice and we have been um, very careful to contribute to this. Actually, most of our findings and our deliverables have been delivered directly to the policy DGs, to our colleagues who then manage the communication. And, um, well, a crisis is a crisis, and as such, uh, many things happen that are not controlled and can happen. But uh, in our communication, for example, with um, the ECDC, it has been a collaboration. Since the beginning, we have opened a channel with the ECDC, and we have uh, been um, very uh, collaborative and careful in um, making sure that we did not go out with conflicting messages. Not because we, we hide any results, but um, because we, we always develop our models uh, in collaboration together with them. And while they were taking care of the official communication, the official data that are often discussed with the member states and are the results of the discussions and, and um, long meetings, uh, almost daily meetings with the member states, uh, we contributed to our knowledge to brief our services, to brief the president of the commission and, and to brief our hierarchies discussing internally with measure the European Commission had to propose. Uh, this uh, this um, dichotomy between uh, health and economy that uh, David referred to was uh, debated and already on the 15th of April, the Commission, based on our advice, went out with this communication saying health issues but also economy, we have to make sure that both uh, survive and this was based on our advice. But I don't think, you, you can contradict me, but I don't think we, we went out with divergent messages because we were very conscious that the communication to the citizens was key. And in these very delicate phases, it would be very counterproductive and dangerous to go out with complete message. Once again, not to be misunderstood, it's not that we have in our drawers any findings that would have contradicted, but sometimes when you even communicate on RT level, which is slightly different between 1.4 and 1.6, could that create confusion. So we didn't do this. All our findings are public or, or online, uh, but um, if the, with the ECDC, it has been a matter of collaboration rather than competition. In the beginning, we have really supported them with our models because we were ready. Our models were already active and we have been helping them. Over time, they've built their own capacity, but even now we are collaborating to go out with, uh, with public, with the joint, um, reports and joint the documents. We have been sitting next to next, uh, next uh, desk with our colleagues uh, in the policy DGs, in the meetings with the member states, in the various committees. There are, there are almost daily activities in, in Europe, member states sitting there with the commission services and as the scientists advising next to them. But um, mm. this was our, our main, main task and we, we fully understood the difference of roles. There are other actors that you have mentioned, like uh, Frontex, for example, in their respective field, uh, always based on collaboration. And then if I can later on, I would like to come back to this uh, cognitive relationship between communication of science, maybe in my following intervention. Yes, yes. We, we need to follow that up. And I actually wanted to follow that up with Christian. I mean, I have been also following, since I'm originally German, I have been following a little bit of German news and I realized that you had a very exposed role in, in the media landscape and that, but also that somehow changed. And how was that? And how did you experience that as you 
said in your earlier statement, you are basically a, a, a scientist, right, working in the world of laboratories and universities, and, and then all of a sudden being exposed in a situation like that to the public, and very much, I mean, uh, celebrated, but then there is also a second reaction now coming in with all kind of uh, more criticisms and negative responses. So how was your experience of that, the importance of the public communication and your role in it? This is very complex and, and difficult to, uh, to summarize. So what I've communicated always um, was science. So the content of my, my communication um, was always about data and studies uh, and how they can be read and what this means for maybe the further um, fate of the epidemic in, in our country. Um, so the media, some media, I have to say, only some, um, used these scientific messages to derive political messages. Um, and to contrast uh, persons, so to go at, after the person rather the content, to play the man rather than the ball, um, and to create messages that actually dilute the information. And that, that also uh, led to a destruction of, of the trust of the public in uh, political decisions. Um, for instance, we, we knew by end of April that children shed virus um, at significant concentrations. And by now, many other groups have confirmed this finding um, that, that we found based on our own laboratory testing of many uh, patients of all age groups. Uh, and this was attacked by the media in a very inappropriate way. Um, and even though it is now clear that the content of the attack was all wrong and that other groups have found the same finding. And, and it's now very clear that uh, schools suffer outbreaks all over the place in many other countries, um, in Germany. Um, still, the, um, this attack on our work has opened the door for a misleading discussion in society um, over which politicians have actually um, become complacent, um, which, which has been used by, uh, by decision makers uh, to, to in fact um, justify um, a, a lack of activity and lack of decision making. And we are, we are now reopening schools without any restrictions. Um, this is exactly what we've warned, cautiously warned, based on our own data. Um, and so this is May, June, July, August, August, four months in which no decisions were taken. Um, that could have been taken based on the data we generated. And now it's, uh, it has become clear internationally. Um, so groups in the US and, and uh, in several other countries have generated the same evidence. And in these countries, um, it seems that the discussion process has been more fruitful. There is more cautious discussion around the opening of schools. And of course, it is a very difficult subject. And um, I've already always been clear about my personal opinion that schools have to be reopened and that we need the education sector for several reasons. Um, that is absolutely inevitable to reopen schools, but at the same time, that we shouldn't neglect the data and that the data say it is not right and it's not proper to assume that the virus is not transmitted in schools. Um, and this has, this is in fact um, what, what has dominated the discussion over a long time. So a fight of uh, experts and non-experts, mainly non-experts, arguing that there is insufficient data to prove that the virus is actually transmitted in schools while there is observations in, in other settings of study like family cohort studies showing that children seem to be less affected. And this has all been mixed up. So the clinical presentation of the disease in children versus the um, 
the probability of, of children to transmit the virus, the likelihood. And um, I think we are still in this, in this distracted discussion um, as we speak, um, and we have lost precious time. Um, and, and I believe this has been triggered by a very small sector of the media. Um, uh, my experience also regarding the media was that the majority of, of media, print and television and, and other broadcasting media, were very insightful and um, also had a hard time to deal with this discussion. But still, um, when the message is spread and there are um, groups who, who need this message for their interests, then it's very difficult um, to, uh, to maintain um, the agreement in society. Yes, yes. This is um, many important points and to maintain consensus and, and uh, compliance to these rules is, is definitely a task that gets uh, more difficult as time goes by and the longer we are in this pandemic and we we see this now, we see this also here in Norway. But uh, let me turn to Debbie now. I mean, one of, some of the points that um, that Christian just mentioned and others is is what you also mentioned. You mentioned this trade-off between, you know, different, all of a sudden the economy was, you know, more important for some people than the health. Now, Christian also brought in education as another important sector, you know, and how do we do this trade-off? And, um, and uh, you, I, if I heard you correctly, you were basically saying there was, there was also a one-sided perception in the public of these trade-offs, you know, that you have to, cho to choose either we do the economy or we do this. And I heard Christian also saying that the same was maybe true or is maybe true still in, in Germany, that either we chose, choose the education of our children or we, do, we are doing just, you know, be very preventive on, on, on the health side. Now, what, what is your, your take on that? You, you said basically that that is normally not the case. Actually, you, if you look at the data, some of these things go very well together. What, what is your reaction? Yeah, no, I'm just struck listening about how many of the debates are occurring in every domestic setting, the exact same debates in many countries across the world and on schools. Exactly what I think has happened with schools, at least I can talk about the British experience, is you've gotten science mixed with advocacy. So you have a good big group of people who say kids have to go back, they have to go back, and they try to, you know, play down the science that says that children transmit and that you have seen clusters in children. And then you have others that, you know, warn about the dangers of children and uh, of having the virus. And I mean, it, you can believe both, right? You can think both that children can transmit the virus and we will see clusters in school as well as thinking, how do you get schools open? And at least in Scotland, <clears throat> what I've tried to advocate for at least is a more balanced approach, which is that if you stop community transmission and you bring numbers really low, then actually you can open schools and the safest way to open schools is not to have the virus get into the school at all. So really go after community transmission and then your schools can open. Because the hard thing is in opening schools, as and I think the United States shows this in my home state, Florida, it's if you open schools and there's lots of cases in the schools, the school shuts. So you have the school open, a lot of kids become infected, then it shuts. All kids are out two weeks. Then it opens, a bunch of kids get infected, then it shuts, two weeks. Kids don't have a sustainable educational experience. And so um, I guess tied to that on, um, I know on kind of the list of questions that you had sent, you asked about Europe and one of the things I think that has been confusing across Europe is every country has chosen a different strategy towards community transmission. How much do you tolerate? How much do you accept? Do you accept quite a lot? Do you accept a little bit? Do you want a certain level of infection to build up some kind of immunity? Do you want no level of infection? Do you try to go for a Taiwan, New Zealand model? And in some way, if this was an Ebola-like event, or if it was like MERS, you know, where you know, a third of people seem to have died of the patients who got it, in South Korea, then you would expect that all governments would get together and say, we have the same strategy because you couldn't let that kind of virus through your population. You would never have, you know, Ebola and just say, okay, well, we'll let a certain number of people get it. And then, and that's the approach that was taken in whether it was West Africa or when it came, you know, now in the DRC, you get rid of every case because you can't tolerate any acceptable incidents. And I think across Europe, what you've seen in every country is a different acceptable incidents. What's the acceptable incidents to keep life normal? What's the acceptable loss? 
And my view, I guess, going forward, looking at, okay, well, how do you reconcile it? And I guess that's what you're asking me, Matthias, is how do we move forward is that if you want to get maximum normality in daily life, kids back in school, shops open, public transport, um, with you really need to have the lowest number of cases and ensure your testing and your tracing can do that work. So if the numbers are really low, you're, you have enough testing capacity, you have enough tracers, you can hunt down every case and you can keep it down. Um, and then you sometimes have super spreading events where someone goes to a bar or a pub and they infect a lot of people. We've had um, a few of these happen across Britain. And then at that point, you have to race with your testing and bring in mobile testing units and try to test everyone and get, I think, you know, in Aberdeen in Scotland over one night, there was over, you know, 30 venues and affected over a thousand people went into quarantine over this, you know, so you got to have a check on those. And I think though, the difference with Germany, with Britain is we haven't had any testing at borders or border restrictions. So they have some kind of loose quarantine, but there's no compliance. They basically say, okay, if you're arriving back from, a, let's say the United States, please isolate for two weeks. But there's no checks, there's no monitoring, there's no testing, there's no screening, and there's basically no follow up. And so that's created a problem as well, because you keep kind of trying to keep on top of low number of cases with your testing and tracing, you're watching out for your super spreading events, you can try to bring in local restrictions if that occurs So ask people don't travel outside of that area while we do the testing and the tracing. But if you have constant importation of clusters, it becomes it's impossible right it's like you're emptying water from a bucket and it keeps getting filled you'll you'll lose. Um, so yeah, so I think if we look ahead, if we do ever, I'm looking at Israel going into a second lockdown, you know, as numbers skyrocket in France and Spain, um, Germany looks relatively stable. Um, the UK is in a really fragile position because the testing is broken down. They've had too many people demand tests after schools went back because of all the kids with coughs and colds. So the testing is breaking down, which means your tracing is breaking down. Um, numbers are coming out, but we're not really sure if that's at all accurate. If most people can't even book a test, then if you have a confirmed number, it's not really telling you how many cases you have. And the real worry is about a second lockdown and how do you avoid that occur happening because we know lockdowns are so catastrophic. So I think, um, you know, we are looking to places like Denmark, like Germany, places that seem to have a handle on it and seem to be keeping the numbers down and trying not to repeat what we're seeing in France and Spain, which is first you see your cases go up, then a few weeks later you see your hospitalizations, then a few weeks later you see your ICU, and then you reach a position like Israel, where if all your ICU units are starting to fill up, you have no choice but to lock down because you can't have people dying in the hallways of hospitals because they can't get oxygen. So your hand is kind of forced. So I think it's this cycle we're in, and unfortunately in the United States, we've seen lockdown lifted, you know, restrictions again, and lifted and restrictions and people fatigue of it. And I really hope at least in, we get out of this circle. It's like an endless circle we're in. And right now the debates in Britain are exactly what we had in March, which is, do you to let it go? Do you impose restrictions? And what we've learned is move fast, get in quickly, squash the numbers and try to get your testing back on top of it. But um, yeah, I think that's kind of where my, my, my thinking has got to, which is if you want your schools running, if you want your economy going, you've got to keep your numbers low and to try to do that in a way which is minimally um, disruptive um, in terms of the measures you put in. So that's the balance. Yeah, thank you very much, Flavia. I think this raises an issue we might come back to. This is also, there are ethical issues behind that. But before that, I would like to put a question to basically all of you. And, and that is, even though, I mean, you had different roles, but um, we, can, we can see, and you all are experts in your field. You all are, have scientific training, but, and I come back to this many voices what was discussed in the high level panel and what I think I also have seen in many places is that there was sometimes even something like a competition between experts. What you have stressed, and I think that is very reasonable for evidence-informed policies, is you have stressed the data, you have stressed the testing, the diagnosis, and, and, and that sort of thing. And, but we have also seen a, a, sometimes maybe an overflow of modeling of theoretical models that were thrown into the public. And even before actually they were published with the peer review, you know, these were pre-publications. And it seemed very often that these uh, models were, you know, beating each other on the head and, and, and were coming out of maybe a, a uh, you know, a, a very eager personality that personalities of scientists that wanted to increase their influence. So there's personalities coming in, in the sciences also. There is maybe the wish for influence and power and funding. 
And all that plays in that relates to our scientific culture, where we sort of are used to compete with each other scientifically. But now this field opened up where we even competed very often prematurely, maybe in the public sphere. So is there any co comments on that, this, this kind of thing in the scientific culture that uh, maybe complicated that, that issue? I don't know who wants to, uh, Christian, you have any ideas about that? Maybe, maybe somebody else can, can answer this. Okay. Sorry. I'm great. Can we? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, question you raise, and I'm not sure I have the, uh, uh, <laughs> the um, a ready answer, but I think one of the things is also if you have to look at how you organize these, uh, the input from different disciplines. Um, and I think if you're um, one of the things that might happen if you have a, a very monodisciplinary input from science into policy is that from other disciplines, people uh, react and say, yeah, but this is just one perspective on this issue. So uh, it would be interesting to see, uh, and I think that's something we have to, uh, uh, to evaluate uh, in, in the long term, but if you organize uh, uh, an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary forum, and you let these uh, different disciplines discuss this be between each other before they present an advice to policymakers and also make it transparent uh, to the general public, then uh, that might be an interesting way to do it because then you, um, you acknowledge also that different disciplines have different perspectives on issues and that there is a weighing of interest or sometimes also that they can contribute, that they can help each other. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, the use of the behavioral expertise, which we need now in this phase, is not something that competes with the, uh, uh, with the more, uh, um, the ideas from public health uh, uh, experts, but it can really help because it can make us understand why do we find it so difficult to keep these measures up over time. Uh, and that can also help us communicate the importance of these measures uh, uh, better. So it might be interesting to look at what if we combine these different disciplines, these, these voices, and put them in uh, a room, whether it's a real room or a virtual room, uh, before we uh, um, we go to uh, to the policymakers and to the general public, I can I can maybe add a, a very small bit, which is because you asked for um, for this let's say monodisciplinarity regarding public health or epidemiological modeling. Um, I I think there is a time for certain scientific disciplines. And in, in the early phase of reacting to such an epidemic, I believe there is nothing else than epidemiological modeling that can dominate the scientific advice. Um, epidemiological modelers are aware of the uncertainties they, uh, they imply um, um, and, and they try to correct this in, in their models. But I, I remember when it was really the early phase and when um, when politics really asked for advice there was complete silence across the field so after months we had like pediatricians um, and i don't know what clinical disciplines and then beyond this social scientists and so on um, coming um, sometimes with with an, an accusation um, that they have hadn't been heard, but there was nothing to hear in the beginning. Um, there was nobody, no scientific discipline that dared to to make a statement when politicians really asked for it. Um, there was complete silence, and only after the event, people then claimed that they could have advised different. And I, um, I think it is. It is just the purpose of epidemiological modeling to provide predictions that you need in a period of uncertainty when there is no other input from any other scientific discipline. And it's completely unfair 
to accuse epidemiological modelers of having been wrong um, for, for two reasons. First is there is nobody else, no other discipline who could have known better. And second, epidemiological modeling was not wrong in this case. The predictions were right, as we can see in the few countries where there has been no non-pharmaceutical intervention. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, Debbie, we wanted to comment on that as well. Maybe Alessandra as well. Yeah, Debbie, Chris. Yeah, and just two points. The first is you asked about different loud voices. So if I look across the world, um, I think there's kind of three different camps that at least I'm hearing from large, large, large loud camps. So the first is, you know, sci scientists who believe that this COVID-19 is incredibly serious and it needs to be managed carefully and suppressed. Um, and that's one view. The second view I'd say is what we call like the natural immunity camp, which is lockdowns are causing a lot of harm. At a certain point, we need to have this go through younger populations and, um, and try to shield the vulnerable. It's the idea that you can shield a certain group of elderly or vulnerable people and let the rest become infected. So you hear that view a lot, quite a lot in Britain. And then the third view is the people who will just think the whole thing is a hoax, right? Like this is, it doesn't exist. Um, I don't fully understand it, but something related to 5G, um, you know, anti-mask, anti-vaccine, this is all Gates, WHO, Clinton conspiracy, like this kind of view. So I think it's very hard because you hear all these voices, but in the end, most people fall into one of those three camps of where they're sitting on this issue. And on, on models, um, you know, I'm quite sympathetic to the modelers because I feel that they were asked to be oracles, right? Everyone said to them, predict, us, predict the future for us. Um, and scientists now are continually being asked that, right? People are saying, can we have Christmas? Is this gonna, are we gonna have a vaccine? Um, is reinfection possible? And they're just questions that we can guess at, but we don't have concrete answers to. Um, and models are only as good as the inputs and the relevance. So two examples I'll give of, of models where I think just shows why you need not just models, but kind of balanced expertise. And the first is shielding. So one of the ideas is that you can shield the vulnerable and run it through the rest and you reach some kind of immunity. And so one model, modeler explained it that you put all the healthy people here, you take all the vulnerable people onto an island, you have a big epidemic run through and then you bring back the vulnerable and then everyone is saved, right? But we've seen with care homes, with multi-generational homes, that shielding the vulnerable is incredibly hard. I mean, schools, again, to come back to schools, if I think of how many parents I know who are cancer survivors, asthmatic, have hypertension, are overweight, we go through all the risk categories. Um, what happens to those children? Do they not go to school? Do we create kind of a two-tier society? A model can tell you how it looks like, and I've seen models around shielding, but it doesn't really tell you how you would actually do that in real life. And the second is around NHS capacity or healthcare capacity. The many of the models tried to look at what point would healthcare capacity be overwhelmed? So how much time would you have? What level of infection? But when I was looking closely at one of these models, they were only looking at number of beds. They weren't looking at number of people. And actually one of the biggest things that you, you saw was the number of healthcare staff who were having to self-isolate or took leave or were shielding or taken off of wards that your biggest issue is not necessarily having enough ICU beds, is do you have enough ICU staff to be able to fill those beds? If the model didn't include that parameter, then you could have a model that actually would not play out onto to what would actually happen. So I think it comes back to models are incredibly useful, but I think the burden put onto them by the media, by policymakers to kind of tell us, tell us the future um, is, is put high expectations and has to be balanced also with you know, social science and behavioral science and ethical issues, which in the end, most of these issues come down to ethics and morals more than actually purely technical answers. Yes, yeah, we were balancing the different values. Yes, Alessandra, you wanted to say something about this. And after that, I, I see with some, uh, or that uh, time is really running very quickly here. Uh, so, Alessandra, make your statement and, statement and then maybe we can have a final round with the final views from all of you. But Alessandra, you have a first thing on this one. Yes, I had like to say that both as a citizen and as a policy taker, a, a policy maker and decision taker, I prefer to have more, more voices. I don't think that one only voice is good for science and I don't think it is good for policy makers. It is much better to have a variety of opinions provided they are based on quality. This is the, the difference. 
And if we have more good opinions, then the policy take, the decision takers can base their decisions on good scientific advice, can, can contradict each other because it is normal and is part of science. What is not good is uh, the, the false, the fake news. And, and during the pandemics, during the crisis, we have seen a lot of groups producing fake news. Fake news are produced professionally. There are groups that are out there and they produce fake news for their own business, for their own purposes. And, and they create hybrid threats to, to us. And, and there are others that try to counteract this and to fight. And how, the, the real question is, how do we explain to the people the difference between the two? Because it is not more science that we influence uh, the citizen's mind and the citizen's decision on whether to take a vaccine or not. We need other tools and there must be other ways because it is not more science. And I can tell you, living in a country, Italy, where this debate about uh, vaccinating children took place years ago before the pandemic, and the state, the, the, the state, the government had to intervene, making vaccine obligatory. You don't vaccine your kid, you, he doesn't go to school, she doesn't go to school. So it's really very complicated, very complicated. But the worst thing would be, in my opinion, to have only one voice. So I, I hear you all saying that uh, we need to retain this multiplicity of different scientific voices. We need to bring them together as early as possible. We need probably, as has been mentioned also in the other high level discussion, we need to communicate the uncertainties, but we need to make sure of a good quality that goes out, a quality assurance in what goes out. But uh, giving the time, can I ask you for a final comment very briefly make it short, your wishes, what have we learned? What would you hope us that we can hope we can take with us uh, for the rest of this pandemic or for any future pandemic? And I'll start with Anne Great. Thanks, Matthias. Um, I would like to reflect on the position of science advice because I think in this pandemic, after years of signs of declining trust in science, we've seen that in almost all countries, at least in Europe, uh, governments relied heavily on scientific expertise and also in general citizens showed high trust and acceptance of scientific expertise. Experts were really at the front line, but I think it's important to see that is, there's also a danger in this. If we don't deliver or if the expectations are not realistic of what science can deliver, there's a potential risk of backlash. So that's why I think it's, it's, it's permanent attention is needed for the division in responsibilities between scientific advisors and policymakers, and with the communication of this division to the general public. The general public should understand that scientific advisors provide expertise, but that it's the responsibility of the politicians to weigh that advice against other considerations and make the policy choices. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anne Alessandra your final statements. In addition to fully subscribing to what Andre just said, I fully agree with her. Let me say that we have learned how to deal with the crisis. Now we have all the tools, we have all the bullets, we know how to deal it, including the second wave. I think we are prepared for this. It is the future which is more uncertain. I would look at the future and I'd like to understand and study uh, what this uh, pandemic and this crisis has changed in our societies and what we have to foresee. Because we were not prepared for this crisis, we have to be prepared for the future because it will be too painful if we are not and if we don't act now on the effect in all the different fields. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Christian, your takeaway messages. Um, I, I believe um, there is, we, we are in the middle of this whole story. So I, um, I believe it's a bit early to, um, to generate concluding messages. But one message that I, that I really have is that um, the information of the public is the most important non-pharmaceutical intervention in this present uh, situation. And this tool has been blunted by many um, misleading streams of discussion in the public. And I, I believe that public health agencies should really try to contribute to this 
um, non-pharmaceutical intervention as well. So this is uh, something that we have to put on the agenda. Thank you very much, Christian. Debbie, your final statements or messages. Yeah, so just two reflections. So the first is, um, having worked on, I guess, infectious disease outbreaks in low-income countries, I don't think anyone saw coming how much richer countries like the United States and Britain would suffer. I think that was just blindsided everyone. Um, and I think, you know, the worry was always an outbreak like what we saw in Guinea or something coming out of Haiti or some very poor context, but this was something that came out of a, a much wealthier context spread through elite networks and really devastated countries that always ranked really highly on pandemic preparedness. Um, and the second point is in all countries, I think it really pulled back the tide on existing inequalities. Um, wealth is the best shielding strategy. If you wanna not get COVID, if you wanna get through this crisis, if you're wealthy, your chances are much better. If you're poor, you're more likely to get COVID and you're more likely to suffer through the measures that are put in place, the lockdown type measures. Um, so those are kind of just my midway, I guess, through reflection of this pandemic so far. Thank you very much. And uh, our time is over. I want to thank you all our great four panelists for very interesting, thought-provoking um, contributions to our discussion here. The discussion is obviously not finished. It goes on. We are right in the middle of the pandemic, as Christian was saying that, uh, but hopefully we can take some lessons already with us. And this about the communication is certainly one of them. And um, I also would like to thank the audience that has been joining us online. And um, so thanks for, for, to all of you. And I would like to also the audience to uh, be aware that there will be a European satellite event tomorrow on science advice, what works in a crisis. Uh, I think it's in the afternoon uh, tomorrow. Uh, you can find the information on the INSA website. So thanks a lot to all of you and have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>